And right now here in Colorado, Colorado voters will decide the fate of nine different ballot amendments and propositions next month. Everything from doctor-assisted suicide to creating a statewide health care system and raising the minimum wage. Well, today we're going to take a deeper look at Amendment 71, which would make it more difficult for Coloradans to get things on the ballot that change the state constitution. And joining us right now to talk about what they see are the pros and the cons of Amendment 71 are former state Senator Josh Penry, who is here from Raise the Bar in support of Amendment 71. And we also have Phil Doe with us from Be the Change, which is opposing this measure. So thank you, gentlemen, first for being here. here. Appreciate it. Uh, Josh, let's start with you. We know that this amendment requires specific signature changes to get on the ballot. So instead of hanging out at grocery stores in, in metro areas up and down the front range, you'd have to go to select parts of the state kind of proportional. So why, why have that change? How would that work and why? First of all, thanks for the chance to be sure. here and explain the proposal. We're excited behind it. Raise the bar amendment 71 is broad bipartisan support for a simple reason. If you want to change the state's foundational document, our constitution, you should have broad base of support. And right now, the way the signature collection process happens, you know, essentially these, uh, the proponents usually of an amendment come to an urban area and get a lot of signatures and it's over. And what our amendment would do is very simple. It says if you want to change the state constitution, after all the constitution belongs to the entire state, you have to go to the, to the four corners of the state, all 35 Senate districts, and get their input as well. And that makes it harder. So why would you want to make it harder then to have the amendment or have the Constitution change? Colorado's Constitution is easier to amend than any other in the United States. And what we've seen is a, a realm, a whole host of shenanigans from interest groups on the right and the left, in fairness, uh, over the course of the last 10 years. Um, we have the third longest Constitution in the United States. Even this year, a number of the measures you proposed uh, are addi uh, new additions to the, to the Constitution. That's why there's been this chorus of voices from the right and the left, a broad bipartisan coalition, all living governors who say we should make it more difficult to amend the Constitution. When you amend it, it should include the support of the entire state, not just Denver and Boulder. I, still, I see Phil holding back here. <laughs> well, I'm just, I mean, first of all, it hasn't been overused. Uh, there are only 48 amendments that the people have initiated in 116 years of the initiative, be it on the, in the Constitution. That's hardly overuse. Uh, they, they make this claim, but it's found, foundless. What we really need to do is make it more useful for the people. I mean, the, the initiative was put in the Constitution so the people would have a control over government, whether it be unresponsive or corrupt. And that's what it's been used for. If you look at most of the constitutional amendments the citizens have initiated, they are about reforming government and giving rights to the people that the legislature is incapable of responding to. Just look at the uh, marijuana initiative, for instance. The legislature couldn't d deal with that subject. The people had to deal with it themselves. And they decriminalized marijuana, which, to my mind, is a good thing. So you, you go back and look at the const what we've done, the people have done with the initiative, and you'll find mostly it's about reforming government. And that is the problem. Big money, ruling elite do not like the people interfering with government. And that's the reason it was put there. And it's ironic that if this thing passes, only the rich will have the opportunity to use the initiative which was created so that people would have the right to defend themselves against government if it acted outrageously. So, Josh, we'll let you step in and, and comment on that then. Yeah, I mean, the, the notion that Colorado's constitution isn't uh, frequently abused flies in the face of everything we see and know. If you got your blue book, on your counter, like I do, you see it's you know it's it's thick like the yellow pages. Um, you know all the TV ads are filled with arguments for and against these ideas that are that are being trying to cram into the Constitution. We have the third largest Constitution uh, in the United States, um, and it is. It, I don't, I'm not sure where your numbers came from. More than 150 times it's been amended. Um, the, the, the important Two part of them, them by the legislature, the, only one third by the than, citizens. Yeah, I, I don't want to quibble on that point. A key point: there are two types of laws. There's statute and the Constitution. Colorado has a very easy process for amending statute. We don't change that. So if you're ang angry at the legislature or the governor, you can go in and change that under the same rules as today. The argument is, though, the Constitution is for foundational principles, unifying notions, and it should be more difficult to change. And that's why you see such, you, like Wellington Webb on the right, and John Southers, Mark Hillman, or excuse me, on the left, and <laughs> Wellington, Mark Hillman, and John Southers right. on, the, on the right, um, coming together because uh, constitutions are spo supposed to protect our rights, and those rights should not be easily taken away. So there's two aspects to this. It's changing the way the signatures are collected, where you can get them from, yeah. and making it 55% approval instead of just 50% plus one. First, let me ask to, to, to the getting the 2% from different parts. I don't, what is it, if I live in Bayfield or if I live in the mountains somewhere, or if I live in Aurora, 
why does it matter whether or not I sign a petition if I get a vote on it in the end? If I want to vote no, I don't, so what? I didn't sign the petition. I still get a vote no if I don't like it. What does that matter? And then why do we make it 55%? So on the first question, why give the state a voice? I mean, I think it's an obvious it's an obvious answer to even put something before the voters. It's the Constitution belongs to the entire state, and there's essentially a bypass that's occurring now. If you're not inside the I-25 corridor, you don't have any say. And so what we are proposing, this geographic requirement, is not at all exceptional. Most states with a citizen-initiated constitutional amendment process require some form of geographic distribution to make sure that this full, full state is heard in what qualifies for the ballot. Um, well, this on the second piece, just just briefly, a number of states have supermajority requirements as well. Some states require you to pass a constitutional amendment in six, two successive elections. The state of Florida requires 60 percent. We picked 55 percent, and and the proponents of this because it was a, a balanced approach. We want to make the bar high, not unachievable, but higher than than amending state statute. Go ahead, Phil. <laughs> well, first of all, I, this has been tried in five states, and it's been found unconstitutional each time. You, what you're doing is substituting the concept of one person, one vote with some geographic requirement. I mean, try and apply that to a statewide office, for instance. If the governor were running, running for, for office, he would first have to go to each senatorial district in the state and get 2% approval before he could even get on the ballot. Now, does that not sound like a gotcha? It's certain, that's all it is, is a gotcha. But most importantly, it makes it easier for big money interest to go into one senatorial district, have heavy influence, on the outcome in that district and thus deny the majority of the people in the 34 other districts the right to vote on this thing. And you know, there's, a, there's confusion about this. There are a lot of initiatives that are attempted. I've attempted four myself. Very few get on the ballot and even fewer become part of the Constitution. The public is very, very respectful of the Constitution. They weigh these issues very, very carefully. And that's why you only see 48. In 116 years, that's less than one every two years. It's not being overused. What, what the moneyed interests want to do is they want to eliminate it because they want to eliminate the people's right to direct democracy. That's what this is all about, pure and simple. You've brought up big money a couple of times. And I know in the, one of the most recent campaign contributions, there was a $1 million contribution from an uh, oil and gas-related uh, organization. It, this belief that the well, initiative a is a to <laughs> lessen the opportunity for things to show up on the ballot that might disagree with the people who are contributing to the campaign right now. Yeah, yeah. So, so the question about money, we, um, our, 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 in our coalition is broad-based all across the state of Colorado. That campaign finance report that you mentioned also had a contribution, a significant contribution from AAR, AARP, the American Association of Retired People, a group that is, I think, well-regarded and well-known. Oil and gas has invested resources in this campaign because they've been a target of you know, in, particularly invidious constitutional amendments. So is health care because of the threat they're under with the single payer initiative. If you look broadly, the business community and community leaders support this because these constitutional amendments inject tremendous uncertainty either to specific industries or relative to specific rights. And, and if I could just respond briefly to this notion that under our and under Amendment 71 that one Senate district would have too much say. I, that, that argument is always particularly ironic because right now Denver and Boulder have a wholesale monopoly on it. And so what we're doing is spreading uh, the say in the process. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I know there's a lot more that we could cover on this topic, and I apologize we're out of time. But thank you both for, uh, for uh, contributing to our conversation today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.